Welcome to the Sassy Sales Podcast. In this episode, we meet Erica Rabb, a Vice President of Commercial Sales at Salesforce.com and a distinguished Sassy alum. We hear about Erica's experience of going from very large companies like Oracle to much smaller early stage startups and ultimately back to the juggernaut that's Salesforce. We cover what you'll need to think about before making the leap either way yourself. Erica also shares some really insightful advice about how to bridge the gap between work life and home life, perhaps challenging how big that gap really is. Let's get into it. Erica, it's so great to spend time with you today. Thanks for hanging out with me for the next 10 minutes or so. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Awesome. So you're currently at Salesforce. I always like to kick off these discussions with a little bit about what you're doing now and what gets you excited about the role. So can you tell everyone about your role and uh, what fires you up? Absolutely. I am one of the vice presidents in our commercial general business group. I have a team of six AEs and we run a territory of about 25 named accounts in the Bay Area. They are some public customers, some uh, private equity backed firms. Uh, there are about 25 to 30 of them and they all have some Salesforce footprint. So our role is to really um, upsell and cross sell um, the many clouds that, and solutions that are available within the Salesforce portfolio. So this is really interesting to me. Uh, as you know, I was at Salesforce back in 2005 uh, and the territories were much, much bigger then. But as, a, as an organization matures, maybe I can just give it, take a tangent with you for a second. You said yeah. you've got about 25 companies that, you, that you're focusing on, six reps. So how many accounts would an individual rep have? Yeah, each of my reps only have three to four accounts. Right. Um, so there aren't a lot of at-bats. So can you share with everybody, how do you uh, support your reps in terms of account planning, territory planning? What does, what does that look like at Salesforce for you then? Because well, we, we always juice out of those three accounts. It's very different to a lot of the stuff we do in much bigger territories in startup land. Yeah. So we always eat our own dog food here at Salesforce. So we rely heavily on uh, one of our collaboration tools called Quip. Mm -hmm. um, so at the beginning of every fiscal year, we go through an account planning process um, and we're using Quip to collaborate. There are some shifts in accounts from fiscal year to fiscal year. So there's definitely a transition and a handoff between one can be between one AA and another. And so we're using Quip to facilitate that handoff. But, you know, Salesforce has such a large portfolio, and that's one of the things I love about being at a large company. Um, so we're really able to have business level conversations, right? What is this organization's business and what are their challenges? What's preventing them from making money? And I would say nine times out of 10, if we do a really good job at account planning up front, which means looking at 10Ks, listening to investor and analyst calls, um, and really just doing that background, we've got a solution that can typically address their challenge. So we spend a lot of time up front doing the account planning. It is a living, breathing document that we revisit. Um, anytime we get executives or other co-primes involved in the account, it's in the document that we refer back to. So I feel like that upfront investment at the beginning of the year is super valuable to my team. You're giving me chill. Yeah, it's one of, part of my favorite uh, things to do, this sounds really nerdy, is uh, twofold. One is uh, account research and planning at the enterprise level. And the other thing, which makes most people sick, is I love writing uh, proposals, really detailed ones that, to your point, you know, address the things you find in the 10K. Because for me, it's like unraveling a puzzle and trying to solve it for the prospect, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's super fun. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit later about, you know, some of the differences between being in a large organization like Salesforce and being at some of the smaller early stage companies that I was at. And the biggest thing I found is in some of those early stage companies, you know, your customer better have a hammer because you've only got a nail, but here I've got nails and screws and hammers and uh, screwdrivers. And so there's a lot of things to talk about. And that, I think it makes the account planning and the research part even more fun. Got it. And, and then so these, these plans are done at the start of the year. They're in an in a co online collaboration format through Quip, I assume? That's right. And, and how often are they reviewed with your reps? And what, when you're reviewing them, I'd love to know how often you do that. And what are you specifically inspecting for when you look at these? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, we typically do a QBR every quarter and I don't want this to be throwaway work. So if I look back on the last four quarters, um, you know, the first 
the first QBR that I led um, this at the beginning of this fiscal year, it was all around it was all around the account planning doc. Let's go through it. Let's understand it. We're looking at people. We're looking at stakeholders. We're looking at those relationships. Who do we know? Who do we not know? We need to know what do they own today. Um, where's the white space? What's the propensity to buy this other new stuff that we have? Um, what's the partner landscape look like? You know, and where are they in terms of just their maturity as a Salesforce customer? Do they have a small footprint that's mainly sales oriented for opportunity and pipeline management? Are we in the call center? Um, you know, really understanding what our um, competitive landscape looks like and what their competitive landscape looks like. One of the big things I focused on um, at the beginning of the year with the account plans are what are the stories we should be telling? Mm -hmm. Because I think the way an, an AE, whether they're new or old, um, you know, establishes credibility with the customer is customers want to know what other people like them are doing. So a big part of my account plan was Tell me stories like if you have a semiconductor company, let's find out about three other semiconductor companies that are using Salesforce. How are they using it? How have they been successful? What benefits have they seen? And so you asked me, how often do I revisit it? Well, we did the account plan in Q1. And then in Q3, I'm, you know, I said, let's go do an elevator pitch. If you were in the elevator with the CEO for these same accounts that you've had all year, what would the pitch be and what stories would you tell? And so that was a way to kind of revisit the account plan and refresh it and also just make sure that it's not a piece of, you know, throwaway work. Got it. And are you doing any intermediary inspection uh, monthly to sort of check on progress against the plan? You know, I think that's probably a, a, a good idea. I feel like so much of our inspection is done um, in other aspects of the tool. Um, so the great thing about Quip is that it updates, you know, we can, it has a direct live link to opportunities inside of Salesforce. Um, and so that's kind of updated in real time. The, the, a lot of the um, historical insights are updated in real time. So yeah, I, I do inspect it, but I also look at other things that, that kind of drive that inspection. Got it, helpful. I love these tactical tips for people who are having to manage this themselves. So, okay, QBRs, um, uh, good upfront research, and then storytelling, critical aspects of what you do, which I think is great. Absolutely. So let's, let's, let's segue into the topic you mentioned earlier. Uh, you've had a really fascinating career where you've worked for some really large companies, um, Hewlett Packard, uh, Oracle, uh, and then you had some early stage startup experience. And now you're back uh, at the mothership. Um, Perhaps I could help you frame it a little. When you moved from large organizations to, for someone thinking about going into startup land who's worked for an HP or an Oracle or a Salesforce, what do you think might surprise them? And how do you think they should be preparing themselves to make that transition? Like what should they be ready to do or, or, or um, be mentally you know, prepared for to go small? Yeah. So I think the biggest um, change for me going from big to small was that I think I took for granted what it meant to have an Oracle or at the time a Siebel or an HP on my business card. Having that big name behind you, you can typically get the meeting, right? And um, I think when you move to those smaller companies, you have to find more creative ways to get the meeting and really break through. I mean, I started in startup, you know, early stage companies back in 2009, 2010. We, you know, using LinkedIn um, was a novelty. It's not anymore, right? People are getting tons of LinkedIn messages. Um, at my last startup, I found like going back to direct mail. And sending something in the mail and then being able to email and call based on that, that actual piece of, you know, mail or package that I sent was a really effective tool. And I think now being back at a big company, I can typically get the meeting, right? But getting the meeting is challenging when you don't have that big name on your business card. It's funny. Yeah, I talk about that all the time. Um, and when I'm hiring in startup land, I'm looking for people who have that ability to come from a no brand name company and prospect. It's critically difficult. It's interesting. You talk about direct mail. I'm a big fan. In fact, there's a SASE alumni company called Sendoso. It's built a really impressive business out of that automated uh, the sending of physical items to get people's attention because it's so hard to cut through the noise now. Yeah. So um, other, other than that, um, Talk to me about being successful in the role because when you come from these large organizations, there's a lot of resources around you. So what did you notice in particular when you got there? Like, oh, 
there's no more of this being done for me or this has not been built or this is not available. What do you think? Would have been? Yeah. I mean, this is, the, this is the, the good and the bad, right? I mean, you have the opportunity to do a lot more in a smaller organization, right? When I joined my last startup, I didn't like the sales pitch, right? I didn't like the slides. I didn't like the way we were telling the story, but it was up to me as the sales leader to go build the story and find a design person to make the slides look pretty, right? And so I remember drawing out the slides, right? You know, just, it wasn't a napkin. It was probably some eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, but drawing out what I wanted and iterating on that story, the slides are here for me at Salesforce, right? So it's the good and the bad. Um, I think um, if you're used to having a lot of resources, I think even coming in, you know, if you've been the second line manager, if you get to be the, the head of sales in an early stage company, you better remember what it's like to kind of roll up your sleeves and do the work because you're doing more of the grunt work. And that's not a bad thing. You just need to be ready to do that. So if you're describing the sort of personality or profile of person who will be successful early stage, how might you describe that to me? I would say um, you got to be ready to, to do the grit and, and be resourceful and roll up your sleeves. And I don't think prima donnas are going to last very long in those early stage companies. Yeah. One of the things I found coming from large companies myself was that there's a lot of places to hide in a large company, right? It's non of, there's always shared responsibility. Whereas in smaller organizations, there's kind of one butt to kick oftentimes in each function, right? Yeah. Yeah, if you try I, stuff and it doesn't work, it has real world implications because we've got a runway that's going to run out. So true. So true. Yeah. I, I do feel there's a little bit of you spend every dollar as though it's your own when you're in that early stage company. There's a real sensitivity to being fiscally responsible. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe taking a slight different space, we spin the other way, going from small to big. I often tell young sales professionals, particularly ones who want to get into selling to enterprise, that they should at some point in their career go work for a large organization. Now, I'd love your perspective on, on that thought, whether you agree or disagree. And if so, what do you think someone gets by gains through working uh, at a large organization like a Salesforce? Yeah, I absolutely think there's so much benefit in getting that foundational training. I mean, now there's programs like yours, Matt, like Sassy to really train people and give them that context. But I think there's no, you know, in a, in a, as an alternative, being in a big company gives you great foundation great training, great foundation, just the ability to see all the moving pieces, right? Um, I am just so impressed with uh, here at Salesforce, just all the resources that are available, the thought that goes into kind of how everybody works together. And I think as you, you know, being part of a large organization, I think helps you be a more effective seller when you go in and you start selling to large organizations, right? You understand the politics, you understand navigating and understanding who the decision makers are, but the importance of working with those influencers, going high, going wide, um, you know, sometimes doing that internally makes you more effective at doing it externally with your own customer. I couldn't agree more. And I think that, you know, oftentimes I've turned to a rep and said to them, well, it's when I was at Salesforce or, or, or EDS or whatever, IBM was, imagine how, what would you have to do if you were excited about a new technology or tool as an individual? What would you have to do to get $50,000 signed off here? Think about that for a second. And it makes it very real for people, don't they? When they put it in, oh yeah, actually, if I was talking to me as a sales rep, that'd be kind of hard for me to get signed off $50,000 or $100,000 or whatever it happens to be, right? Yeah, and I would say also, you know, at Salesforce, we, we share a lot about how we run our organization, right? We do a lot of Salesforce on Salesforce sessions. I just spent the day with a customer who's also a partner of ours yesterday, and we talked through how we build our alliance program, how we run customer success, right? People are really interested in how Salesforce has built these different components of the business. And so I think, you know, being in a large company, being able to tell your story lends credibility and it just gives you that training and that knowledge that you can take then to a smaller company. 100%. In fact, I remember at Salesforce, one of my favorite things to do was to open up the live org and show people their opportunity <laughs> and ask them if I had it right. I'm sure that's probably against company policy now, but no, we do it. We it was so powerful to say, look, I've got you in best case. Would you agree? Do you think we can get there? I've said, you know, there was, and they, they get it like, wow, you're actually 
living this stuff, right? No, it's yeah, cool. we just did it with uh, a customer yesterday. We actually show the early warning signal to say like, hey, are they at risk of churning? Right. Mm-hmm. And, and how do we manage churn and how do we, we manage propensity to churn and nutrition? So we do it. We share it. That's brilliant. So tell me, uh, as a sales leader, do you have a sort of a personal philosophy that you think about when it comes to working? Yours a little mantra or something similar that really you stick to, to, to that has led to where you are today? Yeah, I think my mantra is do the right thing and good things happen. You know, I work at an organization that's about delivering great customer experiences. I really believe that. I also think as I've looked and evaluated different opportunities at different organizations, I personally need to believe in what I'm selling, right? I need to be excited about the solutions that I'm, that, and, and the business challenges that I'm solving for, for me, um, you know, having front office conversations, talking to sellers, talking to marketers, that's exciting to me. I don't get quite as excited talking to people in supply chain or talking to people about their general ledger. And that's something that I've come to learn about myself, right? I need to be passionate about the things that I'm selling. But I think my overall mantra is do the right thing and good things happen. I really like that. And sort of you know, very tactically for folks listening, you know, if you're at a, at a startup right now and you've got executive leadership who are walking on the edge of integrity and, you know, I, I personally have experienced this and had to make that hard decision. You know, you can probably make some money where you are, but is, is that where you want your legacy to be, to be left, right? You know, that, that you did well, but weren't doing the right thing. Right. And I think Silicon Valley is possibly littered uh, with organizations like that. And in the end, it never works out. Right. Yeah. 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 But I so, think if uh, you take that, I was just going to say, if you take that mantra, I think that helps you establish a good relationship with your customer. And ultimately, people want to buy from people they trust and like. And I really think that's helpful in making you a successful seller and a successful leader. Got it. And so I've been at Salesforce. In fact, as we're speaking today, it's uh, it's January, uh, and I know what that means in the SaaS world. Um, pretty busy. What do you do to decompress, and how do you spend your time uh, outside of work? I probably don't do it well enough, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, but I also think part of that is from I really enjoy and am passionate about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so I probably could use some help in this way. Um, I tend to be looking at that phone, leaving it on my bedside, doing all the things they tell you not to do. Um, but, uh, family is really important to me. Spending time and, um, with my family, my husband, my two children is important to me. Um, but I, they're very aware of what I do and we all talk about our days. And, and one of the questions I always ask my kids at dinner is what did you do to make somebody smile? And we all have to go around and share that. Right. And so I wouldn't say that there's a lot of separation between my work life and my home life. Um, but I think I want my husband, I want my children to see what I'm doing, um, to make people smile and, and make, you know, my, make my small contribution in the world. I love that. Love that last question for you. Uh, so you did, uh, participated in one of our, uh, six month, uh, sassy accountability and development programs not so long ago. For folks thinking about joining one of those cohorts, how would you describe it to them and and, and what you got out of it? So that handout was my Bible for the first six months as a sales leader at an early stage company. I literally carried that in my bag every day. I can't underscore what tactical um, learnings I got out of the session, right? Um, How to run a one-on-one how to do a three-way with marketing and inside sales and and kind of manage that dynamic. Um, I really found it to be really, really pragmatic and practical advice. And and again, I I treated it as a Bible. And then, um, Matt, as you know, I was lucky enough to participate in kind of round two um, where we had a small uh, networking group and we got together. I think it was on a month monthly basis. We did pretty well. And that network has been invaluable. Um, you know, one of, I think there was a, a eight of us, right. Um, we're all in touch. 
It's fun to catch up. It's fun to empathize with one another about the challenges that we're going through. Um, it was great to have both the formal facilitation from you because it was kind of free consulting, um, as well as the the informal networking and just um, bouncing ideas off of one another. And we're all in touch. Um, we love the meetups that you host. Um, and we're here to help each other find the next job opportunity too. In fact, that's happening as we speak with one member of, of the cohort. Awesome. That was great. Erica, thank you very much. Is there anything, any parting words you want to leave with the folks today? Um, no, I mean, I think that, um, you know, managing your career is something that you should take and and you, you should be thoughtful about, right? I mean, I think I struggled a little bit with, is sales the gig for me? And I've realized that it, it absolutely is. And I really think of, you know, sales as a craft. And so I think as I look at different opportunities and particularly when I looked at the opportunity to come to Salesforce, it was, how do I really hone that craft? How do I become a better seller? And how do I become a better leader? And, you know, when I'm in different meetings with different levels of leadership, it's something that I kind of sit back and think about, like, what am I learning to really hone this craft? Because this is the craft that I've chosen to build my career around. That's awesome. Hey, really great chatting with you today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you.